My name is Quincy Franklin. I go by the Black Conservative Preacher or the BC Preacher, all one word. So I'm here today with my man, Mr. Dan Wilson. He is running for the Kootenai County Sheriff position here in Idaho. So there's been a lot of stuff going on, but first of all, I gotta say, I'm kind of intimidated of you. I mean, you're like seven foot tall. I'm just like this little- It's my platform I'm, boots. I'm like this little black dude here, just like a little short guy. And you're like towering over me. So I'm just kind of- Hey, yeah. we're all equal under God, man. Amen. But I do look better than the cowboy hat than you. You do. All right. And we you have, have more hair. I, I do, but I'm not going to take the hat off to show you that. So I just want to clarify that who looks better. It's actually me. So anyway, with that said, I have a lot of questions for you. I got questions from the community. People have been emailing me saying, can you ask Dan this? Will you do an interview with Dan? I'm like, I'll, I'll do something. So I have a bunch of questions to ask you that people actually sent me. So... I hope you're ready for this. I'm ready. You're ready to let's, be transparent because, there, you know, there's a lot of rumors going on about you. You know that. Yes, I do. Okay, so we're, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Dan, I have a lot of questions for you. People have emailed me from the community here in Cor, Cor Lane, Post Falls, Hayden, surrounding areas. So first question for you. Sheriff Norris has stated that Kootenai does not have a sex trafficking problem. Do you think Kootenai is exempt from this global epidemic? If you disagree with Norris's statement, what is your plan to handle this growing concern? Yeah. Kootenai County is not exempt from this global epidemic, and especially here in the United States. Uh, the fact of the matter is we're in a county of 170,000 people next to a county of 550,000 people. We're off I-90, 395, Highway 95. The fact of the matter is we have multiple casinos. We know that we are seizing fentanyl by the, by the truckloads coming across I-90. We're not finding it because we're not actually out looking for it. And that's the reality. It is here, it's most definitely here, but we're just not putting enough effort into finding it and rooting it out. What I would do is I would join up with organizations that are known for being able to run sting operations. And we would partner with them in order to help us with our resources in order to identify and start going after all these predators that uh, are amongst us. Right. So how do you know it's not being looked at? How do you know they're not trying to find it per se? Well, I, I think by the sheriff's own statement saying, you know, they're just not seeing any, any early warning indicators of it. Uh, it the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that if they were finding something, they would be publishing it. it. We would be reading about it in the newspaper. So there's there's too much going on and not enough results of, of, uh, of us finding anything. Right. Now, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I did hear uh, Sheriff Norris mention that there's been only one reported on record. Is that, did you hear that? I don't or? remember if he said one, but I know that NIBRS, that's the FBI's um, you know database on crimes that occur across the country and by, by region. Uh, only recorded one instance of it in uh, in Kootenai County last year. Okay, that's that must have been what yeah. I heard. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And that would have been the 2022 stats because, of course, they're still getting all the 23 stats. Okay, okay. So you are obviously a, a, a big talk of the town right now, yeah. and there's been some things that's came out over the past week regarding uh, you claiming there's been some accusations or criminal accusations mm -hmm. on Sheriff Norris and Bruce Matari, who's yeah. a commissioner. Um, the question is, do you want to do a debate with Norris? Bob, I've been asking for a debate with you for weeks now. And the best you can do is to throw some kind of quasi Kabuki theater challenge on the doorstep where you have something concocted up because you're taking your eyes off the ball um, you're attempting to have people look over here when we should be looking over here with what you're actually doing. Is that is that clear I, enough? I, I hope so. I mean, yeah. it's not my questions. Yeah. It's, it's listeners' questions, yeah. so I'm sure it was. So yeah. um, is there any time frame that you would like to do that debate? I'd say in the next uh, next week, next two weeks, max. So you're, you're, ba you're basically saying Norris... You guys set it up? Not, not basically. We've been saying this for weeks now. So it's not a it's not any kind of a mystery that we've been looking for this, but the sycophants have been stating that they won't have a debate until there's a actual real challenger. So I'm here ready for you, Bob, but the thing is you cannot bring Bruce Matari to your own debate. And you can't wear an earpiece either like Biden does. Oh, all right. 
uh, okay. Um, that caught me off guard. The earpiece, Biden, you know, following up the st- that caught me off guard. Yeah. Sorry, you know. Um, <laughs> CDA Press wrote about Norris deputizing Kootenai County Commissioner Bruce Matari yeah. and had him sign a NDA regarding their high level meetings. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on this situation? I think it's actually completely unethical and immoral. Uh, we have a separation of powers in government for a reason. We do not want there to be any commingling between the executive branch, which would be the sheriff, and the legislative, which in this case would be the county commissioners. Look, if the sheriff really wants to share any kind of information that's classified, he can declassify that and share it accordingly. But the real concern is, is that when you have only one out of three county commissioners that have this special deputization, what are they doing with it, right? What is, what is, what kind of privileged information is, what kind of privilege, do you want me to stop here? What kind of privileged information is being revealed to Commissioner Matari? And do we want our elected officials in this county to have access to privileged information? Otherwise, what good does it do for him to have this special deputization if it's really ceremonial and doesn't do anything anyway? Right. So with all fairness, do we know that they are sharing information? Yeah, Bob, Bob Norris claims that he is sharing that information specifically with Matari in that Coeur d'Alene Press article from, I believe it was November 19th of 2023. All right, well, yeah. there's that. Hopefully that answers your it's, question. It's highly unethical, <laughs> highly unethical. All right, there you go. All right, so fourth question. Sheriff Norris received a $200,000 donation from the CDA tribe for the rescue helicopter, and shortly after the donation was made, Norris terminated the sheriff's patrols on tribal land. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion regarding this change? Well, I I don't know if um, terminated is the correct word, but, but basically pawned off the responsibility of law enforcement down on tribal land. So there's there's a, a U.S. rule called uh, 280 that, re, that is, um, it, it's in regards to how law enforcement handles law enforcement functions at the state level on tribal territory. So in Idaho, uh, we have the ability, if the tribal lands are in our county, we are able to perform all law enforcement functions on uh, the county property that happens to also be tribal. And the tribal community has the ability, if they are calling for law enforcement, to specifically request uh, tribal police come and respond. But otherwise, anybody else that's a non-tribal member should be able to have a sheriff's deputy show up to their place when they call for law enforcement. And right now, in I believe it was December 8th of 2022, I've read through the emails, the tribe asked to take over all the law enforcement functions to include traffic stops, uh, domestics, all of that, and uh, my my sources have told me that that the sheriff's office has not been responding to calls unless specifically asked by the tribe. And I know that I've talked with the sheriff in Benoit County, who has also um, confirmed the suspicions that the Cooney County Sheriff's Office is no longer actively patrolling the tribe. So they're no actively they're they're no longer actively patrolling the tribe based off of. What the, the yeah that, that email so my understanding from the emails that went back between tribe and Kootenai County Sheriff's Office is that there was a request by the tribe for the tribal police to take over all law enforcement functions on tribal land, and in exchange Norris through the sheriff's office cross deputized all Coeur d'Alene tribe uh, police officers. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So okay. I think that's uh, something that the sheriff needs to give an explanation to the people of the county. That's about one third of the county that he is no longer actively patrolling. And then number two, he's allowing citizens inside that county to, um, you know, be, I I guess all the law enforcement from a federal agency, Mm -hmm. the tribe, it's a nation within a nation, is now taking over all those law enforcement functions that, you know, I as as a citizen, if I'm paying tax dollars uh, down in, in tribal land in Kootenai County, I deserve to have the county show up to take care of my needs when I call for those services. Okay, now did he get donations from citizens here in Kootenai County or well, just from the tribe? I, there was, uh, you know, when we, we're talking about the helicopter program, which the helicopter is a uh, private LLC that owns that helicopter. 
And I know that there was at least five donors that donated over, I believe it's $100,000. And then the tribe, of course, gave $200,000. This can be found in Kootenai County Commissioner's uh, meeting minutes back from, I think it was like October of, of uh, 2022. But yeah, there was, um, there was an agreement to use a private entity that owns a helicopter and exchange that Cooney County pays for the upkeep and the maintenance, uh, they put some of their, their equipment on it. So yeah, I mean, it looks suspicious to me, but I, I don't really know. So you're, you're just saying it's something to look into. Absolutely. Right, yeah. right. Okay, what is your opinion on accepting federal grants? Uh, I'm not a fan of receiving federal dollars. I think that we should be keeping the dollars that we give to the federal government right here so that we don't give it to them and then they return it back to us. I think federal uh, funded programs are dangerous because we don't know what strings are attached to it. And if we're gonna maintain our uh, sovereignty at the county level, we need to be very, very careful at what dollars we're, we're receiving from federal grants and what strings are attached, what contract requirements are there. So as a general rule, I'm not a fan of federal grants. I'm not either. Yeah. Okay. So we're on the same page. We are. All right. Good. Good. I think I'll vote for you. So just, just letting you know. <laughs> just don't vote twice. Don't. They do that in Washington, but you can only vote once here. Well, I'm a black, so, I mean, just. <laughs> we're all equal. <laughs> okay. Under God. <laughs> so here, here's another question for you. Post Falls has been allegedly housing illegals at the Red Lion. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have knowledge that the mayor of Post Falls is receiving kickbacks from the feds? What can a sheriff do about stopping this? Uh, I do not have firsthand knowledge of the situation. Um, I think that if it were true and a sheriff was made aware of that, that a little investigation needs to take place. And then if laws are violated, they need to be, um, you know, acted upon. Okay. I don't have any information on it either. Yeah. It was just a question that yeah. someone sent in. I've heard so. all sorts of hotels around Kootenai County in general, so that's that's just one right because there's no really, there's no way to at this point to find out the facts on that. To, yeah. So, all right. Um, what are the top three ways your administration would differ from the present sheriff's administration? Mm -hmm. Uh, number one, no nepotism. So we are not going to be joined at the hip with the Deputy Sheriff's Association, the federal or the uh, Fraternal Order of Police. Um, so if you're an e-board executive, uh, that does not mean that you're going to automatically be on command staff with, with me. Uh, number two is we're going to reevaluate uh, from a cultural standpoint exactly what's going on in the entire organization from top to bottom. And we're going to bring in uh, folks that are going to help us realign the values of serving the people. Law enforcement is a calling. So we're gonna create a culture of uh, calling and extreme ownership. And then lastly, we're going to be accountable dollar-wise uh, as far as what we're doing with the, with the taxpayer's you know, uh, uh, treasure. So we're gonna do a, a forensic audit from top to bottom and we're gonna find out where those dollars are going and we're going to adjust accordingly. Now you mentioned FOP, could you elaborate a little bit on that? The FOP? Yeah, the Fraternal Order of Police, that's basically, you know, uh, we don't have unions in Idaho, but police officer associations are, are generally uh, the fraternal order of police. And so the local, um, you know, municipality police and sheriff's office will have these different organizations for the patrol deputies or police officers in order to help protect them and their rights in the way that they conduct themselves and, and do their, their duties as law enforcement, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now you mentioned something as well, and I haven't really heard this from many law enforcement officers ever. You said a calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, I believe that most people, when they decide that they want to be a police officer, uh, they feel something inside them that says, hey, I want to help people. I want to pursue justice. I want to take care of the, the most vulnerable and the innocent. I want to go after bad guys. And then, you know, if you're lucky enough to be selected for an agency, whether it's a, a sheriff's office or a police department, and you go through the academy and you graduate, and after you graduate, you, you go through your probationary period where you're, you know, um, you're, you're being field officer trained uh, and you're an actual police officer, I think that that is when you really realize whether or not you truly have the heart to serve people and to take care of them, right? Mm -hmm. And most, cops that, that I've worked with generally do love to 
serve other people. They want to protect people. They want to pursue justice. Unfortunately, we have also seen a drift towards people that get into law enforcement, not because it's a calling, because it's something that they feel that they need to do, but rather it's for a dollar. And mm. it's, it's to make a buck rather than to actually serve and protect their community. And in a calling, you don't always get rich. Um, you think of pastors, you think of teachers, anybody that has you know, one of these, these calling types of um, positions. And so we need to be mindful of that as well in our culture that, hey, our employees should be compensated fairly to be able to take care of their family members and, and to, you know, in, in, to be able to enjoy life. But we also need to bring back the understanding that we have a calling and that calling calls us to our higher purpose. And it's not just at the end of the day, the dollar. Right, right. And I think that's a big deal because, I mean, you think about calling, that's a servanthood. Yeah. You're serving, you're actually truly serving people right. instead of just ha thinking that your badge is your weight. Right. And you're walking around with some authority. It, right. it should be more of a servanthood than, like you said, worrying about your, your next dollar. Yeah. So I like that because I think that's something that needs to be said across the board about being an officer. It should be a calling instead of, instead of having it be right. a job. Right. So that's, I like that. That's, yeah. that's good. I like that. And I think the, the, the men and women just need to be reminded of that and they need to be encouraged because it's a hard job being a police officer or a deputy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the things that you're exposed to, is it the most dangerous job statistically? No, but that doesn't mean that it's not a hard job day in and day out. And, you know, deputies and police officers, they get tired. Mm -hmm. um, right. You think about the shift work and, and all the things that they're exposed to. So we need to have empathy for these guys. We need to be able to support them so that they can continue their mission fully equipped, but always reminding them every single moment that they they step into that uniform and strap that shield on, that they're there to serve and to protect. Right. Right on. I like that. I like that. Okay. So here we go. You have stated that you would like to instill a culture of answering a call to serve as a deputy, yeah. as opposed to merely seeing the deputy position as a career mm -hmm. with a pension at the end. Yeah. How would you go about creating that culture in the KCSO? Well, I think we just talked about that yeah. um, in, with the previous question, but I would, I would answer that by also saying that there's an individual that I'm going to be bringing into the office uh, on command staff who has a history of uh, law enforcement. And this individual has a, a passion for this very topic. And this individual is going to help me evaluate the department from top to bottom again, from a cultural standpoint, and help evaluate where we are doing good, where we're doing uh, not so good, and then help us with a plan on how we can uh, bring back this calling to the office. Okay, so with that said, this individual, yeah. Another question has been thrown at me recently. John Grimm. Mm -hmm. Would that individual possibly be John Grimm? No, it is not John Grimm. I've met John Grimm one time. I've had one conversation with him, and so I, I don't know enough about John. Okay, so you heard it from the horse's yeah. mouth. It is not John Grimm. Who ran for sheriff last time, as I recall. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Once again. Rumors, is... rumors dead. Rumor's dead. It is yep. not John Grimm. No collusion with John. All right. Yeah. So that check that one off. Yeah. All right. Moving right along here. In what way do you think your years as a excuse me? In what way do you think your years as a volunteer reserve officer has prepared you for this position? And what is your response to those who say that you are lacking mm -hmm. the professional experience of the job? Yeah. Well, I, I love this question. It's probably the most asked question of me next to if I'm pro Second Amendment or something like that. Are you? Well, I'm, I'm beyond pro Second Amendment. I think everybody should be armed at all times. Which we'll get to that after this question. Uh, but back to the, the previous question. So as 12, year, uh, 12 years of experience as a reserve police officer, what that really means is that when I was working for the agencies, Spokane Police Department and for the City of Liberty Lake, when I was working, I had full authority. So if I showed up to any of your calls, I looked exactly the same as a, uh, a, an officer that does it full time. Um, and as a, as a result of, 
of my 12 years of service, I got to experience all the basics of law enforcement. So I've been around it, I've worked patrol, um, I've done the training, I understand the laws, I understand the culture of law enforcement, I understand how command staff works, I, I have a well-rounded experience uh, in the community. The part about the leadership portion, while that's true, I've never held a position of leadership inside of a law enforcement organization. The reality of it is this, for almost 25 years, I have owned and operated a commercial construction company and a commercial construction cabinet shop. In those years that I have been in business, I have learned, and I built these things from thin air, from scratch. I learned how to negotiate contracts. I learned how to hire and how to fire. I learned how to bring subject matter experts into the field to surround me with great um, advice on how to perform duties and, and to take care of things. And the sheriff is an elected position. Mm -hmm. that, that is the supreme law enforcement professional inside the county elected by the people. Uh, it's no different than a CEO. When a CEO comes in to, to, to start running a, a company, uh, the CEO doesn't do every aspect of the work that takes place inside that, that business. And it's much the same way with the sheriff's office. You have under sheriffs and you have your command staff that are the experts and they do all the heavy lifting um, and they run the day-to-day -day operations. The sheriff is the elected official that specifically sets the vision and the command staff and the under sheriff help execute that vision. And the sheriff is, is out there amongst the people finding out what's going on and, and looking ahead down the road to see what needs to be um, you know, contended for at, at a future date. Right. You know, it kind of sounds like, and, re, and re, it reminds me of Donald Trump. And I know a lot of you guys hate me saying that, but it does because Trump had his own business. He didn't know nothing about politics, right. but he was a businessman. Right. And many of many Americans voted for him because he was he, a disruptor. Yeah. He was a disruptor. He wasn't a politician, yeah. and he was a businessman. Yeah. So I mean, in my personal opinion, you kind of fit in that if you want to say box or umbrella. However, you're you're in that playground, that yeah. that that field. Yeah. So you're never going to hear me say that I am an expert on anything patrol or any special unit or even running a sheriff's office. Right. Uh, there are men and women who are very good at what they do that have had a career law enforcement um, you know, resume that, that obviously would be filling in these roles of leadership. Um, but you know, the current undersheriff that we have uh, never held any kind of command staff level uh, supervisory positions either. He was a, a, a line supervisor. He was a corporal, which isn't even to the same level as a sheriff, or excuse me, as a sergeant. So. You know, uh, I, I think it's funny that the same people who will attack me and say you have no experience have no issue with a corporal that's currently the undersheriff running the entire sheriff's office. Right. So why do you think people have the mentality that you that you or somebody needs to be or have all this experience yeah. or be a you know a career you know it's basically a career politician yeah. in a sort of yeah in a way so why do you think people have that mentality that that's what you need to be in order to be a sheriff well, i think a lot of it's territorial so if you have spent your entire life in law enforcement and maybe you have family uh, that has you're going to be protective of them because traditionally we've looked at these positions especially chiefs of police which are appointed by mayors and city council different than a sheriff and, and those are law enforcement um, professionals that have gone all the way up through the ranks in order to sit in the position that they are. But look, the sheriff is a, a an elected position and people have just been trained for many, many years to believe that, um, you know, in order to have a an effective sheriff's office, you have to have career law enforcement individuals that are running it. And mm -hmm. so it's just kind of a cultural thing. Okay, I mean, to be honest with you, I thought people voted for Trump because he wasn't a career politician. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. So it kind of, you know, you're not a career politician yeah. in, in regards and I, and I look at things from a, a lot of different angles. So not only am I looking at things from my 12 years of being a reserve police officer, but I also am looking at things as having been a successful, 20, almost 25 year successful businessman mm -hmm. who has dealt with all the things that the law enforcement administration that our career have not dealt with. Like they, they've never dealt with budgets that were derived of their own dollars or where if they failed, 
that they would be out of business. I mean, the level of success that I measure myself against is either I win or lose. I lose. And there is no real in-between. No Whereas, in between, no, no gray area. You, yeah, if you screw up with the taxpayers, you just ask for more or you, you make some cuts, right? But but the, the taxpayer tit is never dry. Oh, all right, there you go. <laughs> what is the number one priority when you become sheriff and why? Wow. Um, one priority, that's that's going to be a hard one. I would say that definitely forming the citizen's posse, especially right now in this environment that we live, that's probably going to be one of my absolute number one priorities um, in order to get the county ready for events that I think are on our horizon. Citizen's posse. Mm -hmm. That word sounds kind of scary. Yeah. Are you going to come after black people? I think there was a question. Just you. Just, just you. me. Just you. Because there was a question yeah. that was asked to you yeah. about, you know, are you going to go after black people, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no. A, a citizen's posse is uh, constitutional, and what it what it allows, what it does is it allows a sheriff, in order to secure his county, uh, get any individual that he needs in order to secure that county. And, you know, from my standpoint, a citizen's posse is made up of vetted citizens from multiple different disciplines and backgrounds and experiences that they can come and say, hey, this is what we have to offer. And we say, okay, great. We are gonna put you on this list. We're gonna train with you. And in any kind of an event, whether it's man-made or natural, you know, we're not waiting for the federal government to come. We're not waiting for the state government to come. We're gonna take care of ourselves right here and now to triage it so that, uh, you know, we maintain the rule of law. And that's so important. If you don't want society to break down, uh, you don't want to lose the rule of law. And so a sheriff that has all these different volunteers is, is very well positioned to maintain uh, law and order mm -hmm. so that the citizens ultimately benefit from the stability that that brings. Now, do you have any ideas or would you like to, ex would you like to share uh, what the vetting process would be like? I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but it'd be similar to what we do right now for uh, new applicants that want to come to work for any organization, right? So you're gonna do some some basic checks and, and making certain that they're square, and but we'll write that policy and, and finalize it uh, when I take office. That's right, okay. And we're not gonna reinvent the wheel because you know, Mark Lamb's been doing this down out of Pinal County, Arizona. Uh, there There is no reason for us to have to completely rewrite uh, these policies and these programs. We'll have to obviously, um, you know, edit it a little bit for Idaho because Idaho is its own state. But the, the, the long and the short of, of my solution is we just don't need to reinvent the wheel. Right. Okay. Well, we're almost done. We're getting there. We're getting through these questions. I'm we're just almost... getting warmed up. All right. I can tell. I can tell. So um, <laughs> how will you address an audit and if necessary, cut corners to make the sheriff's office run more efficiency? Okay. That's, that's an interesting question. So I've talked about performing an audit top to bottom of the sheriff's office. And not just an audit, I want a forensic audit. Those take a little bit of time and it takes a lot of money that I'm gonna have to ask the county commissioners for. But that gives us, once we get that, that forensic audit, it gives us a very, very good idea as to where every dollar in the budget for the, the sheriff's office uh, is going. And I don't like the term cutting corners. Um, what I would rather say is once we know where the dollars are going and whether or not we have uh, excess funds that we can be diverting from where they're not being used to somewhere where it's needing to be used. Um, I think that we will identify things and prioritize and execute uh, those items and programs that we need. Obviously, patrol and, and all the basic functions, jail, dispatch, those are gonna take priority, but if there are other areas that we need to cut uh, that aren't as essential, we may look at that. I just don't want to go back to the taxpayers and constantly ask the taxpayers for another another increase. Right. Uh, we need to understand, as, as we do in the business world, exactly where our dollars are going, and then we need to have real conversations. People can come and plead to you all the time, I need this, I need this, I need this. Well, prove that you need this, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you've, you've received the same budget for year after year after year, have you really been held accountable to how that, that money is being spent and why should we not look at what the, the dollars are being spent on every level to determine whether or not they're really a good investment for the taxpayers? Mm. Because I mean, a little just, radical. it is a little radical. Speaking of the radical, I yeah. want to backtrack a little bit about your, the 2A. Yeah. 
How radical are you about the 2A? Well, I think shall not be infringed is exactly that, shall not be infringed. I'm not a, a fan of any restrictions on firearms. Um, I don't like, uh, you know, candidates, though, that come out and they say, well, hey, vote for me because I'm the most pro-Second Amendment candidate out there. That, to me, is kabuki theater. I use that term a lot, right? It gets people all emotionally riled up. But as a constitutional yep. sheriff, you should be protecting everybody's rights from the original Bill of Rights across the board equally, right? Okay. The First Amendment is no less important than the second or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth. Correct. And I'm here to tell you that I believe that a well-armed society is a highly secure society. So my belief is that if you can legally own a firearm, you should have a firearm. You should take the time to learn how to safely and effectively use that firearm. Um, but as, as sheriff, one of the things that I think that has been a missed opportunity for many years is there should be citizen range days where the wow. sheriff hosts at, at a range uh, days where you know we can bring in firearms instructors in our A grade uh, members from our community to donate their time that says, hey, um, we're going to teach anybody that does not know how to safely and effectively use their firearm. And there will be, of course, rules and, you know, things that, that you must do in order to be a part of this program. But you come out, you know, no charge and learn from wow. experts on how to actually safely use your firearm. There, there are so many people out here that are buying firearms. And my question is, are they getting the proper training? Part of the responsibility that you bear as being a good patriot, if you're going to exercise your Second Amendment rights, which I hope you do, is you need to invest in good holsters, um, you need to invest in good ammo, and you need to invest in training on how to use that firearm. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know how to use it, you're not really going to be very beneficial in the event that you have to use it. As a a uh, former police officer and somebody that did executive protection work where I had firearms all the time and, and we were training over and over and over and over again. Shooting is a perishable skill mm -hmm. and people take that for granted when they think that they can just get by with going out and plinking at a target once or twice a year. So if you really truly want to be good with a firearm, you need to be responsible, you need to invest in yourself and you need to be trained and you need to keep training. Right, I like that. Now, if you did something like that when you become sheriff, how often would you do some sort of training like that? You well, know? I think I would have to, first of all, see what the response is of the community and then what our resources are. Right. Um, but I would say that at a minimum, we would do it twice a year. I think ideally it would be great if we could do it every you know, quarter. Right. And you know, who knows, maybe it's so successful we're able to do it even more frequent. Right. But uh, yeah, I think it would be safe to say we do it at least twice a year. You know, I never heard of that. I've heard a lot of police departments, uh, you know, they'll do stuff for, you know, how to learn how to buckle in a, you know, a car, car seat, seat yeah. for a child. Mm -hmm. So to do something like that with the 2A, I mean, that's a, that's a great idea. Well, I mean, who better to lead the people than the sheriff? I mean, if the sheriff is supposed to be the great uniter and the chief law enforcement uh, officer in the community, would that not stand a reason that you should also be thinking about how you can best equip your people? Mm -hmm. And look, I want everybody to be able to defend themselves. I don't care what your background is, what your ideations are, none of that. If you believe in the Bill of Rights and you are a good citizen, I want good citizens of whatever belief to be armed because I want people to be safe. I want right. be able to be able I want people to be able to protect their their lives and their their property right mm -hmm. right and that's a great it's actually a great idea because there's a lot of people that love the 2a yeah. buy a gun and then they're intimidated because they don't know what to do yeah. and they're you know they're afraid to shoot it yeah. they're afraid to, they're embarrassed to even go to a range and i think to that's practice. True. embarrassed yeah absolutely. you know and so i think having a program like that would be a great idea especially in a community that's behind the 2a yeah. so and i've shot a lot of firearms over the years right i've, I've dumped thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds right but i don't even consider myself any anything hot when it comes to firearms right and so even i need to be constantly training and i'm humbled every single time i go out on the range so people should not be embarrassed you come at whatever level you are and you're only competing against yourself but look an armed citizenry is a safe citizenry and i believe in dangerous liberty over a certain security do you think sex trafficking is an issue here if you do, then why is it being ignored by the local sheriff 
and or why are we not catching or stopping any traffickers? I think we already discussed that earlier. The, the flyby is, I don't think we're actually looking. We're not, we're not expending the resources, uh, forming the task forces in order to go after this human trafficking. Um, it's definitely here. I've said it before, we're, we're in a community between the two counties in Washington and, and in Idaho, uh, short of three quarters of a million. Uh, we're off I-90, 395, major casinos, Indian reservations. Uh, it's here, but sometimes we aren't looking also because we're afraid who we might catch in the trap. I mean, that that yes. is a reality. Yep. And we've seen these things take place all over the country and people are shocked when they find out who the local predators are, yep. right? Um, so I think that's definitely, you know, could, could be a, a part of it. Uh, I don't know that that's the case right here in Cooney County that I'm not going to accuse anybody of it, but these are just kind of thoughts in general. Um, I also believe in bringing in these uh, third party organizations that specialize it in, in rooting out these traffickers. Um, and I think that when you bring these, these individuals who are former law enforcement, both local and federal, that have the skill sets in order to locate these networks, uh, we bring them in undercover and we let them do their business working alongside our law enforcement and we start making the bus. Right. And when it comes to sex trafficking, there's there's big money involved in that. Yeah, it's it's billions, it's, billions. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, people can... Right actually, here in America, it's billions. Correct. So actually, there's actually people that could be right here in this county involved in it. No, they're, I they're, mean, they absolutely are here in this county. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. And, I if think, we can't, and if we can't protect the most vulnerable among among us, who are we as Americans? I mean, it, it's our job. If, if we think about America as being a just country, mm -hmm. which I know there's arguments as to you know where we're at right now with that whole topic, but justice requires that we take care of the most vulnerable. And who are the most vulnerable? Children. Children. Yeah. And anybody that has a child understands how precious those those th those children are. And we must be doing everything within our power to relentlessly pursue those that would harm our children. There's a Bible verse about that. There are many Bible verses about, about that, that millstone. Yeah. About that millstone. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Four more questions, bud. Four more questions. You are a reserved officer from Washington State, mm -hmm. and the current sheriff, Bob Norris, is from L.A. Yeah. Hmm. Interest, inter, interesting. As he calls it, just, what, the, the just, large county south of Boise. Okay. I, I'm just finding this question kind of interesting because you're from Washington State. Norris is from L.A. Both out-of-state people. Well, but anyway, okay. But anyway, what makes you want to run against him? Okay. To set the record straight, first of all, <laughs> Spokane and Kootenai <laughs> County are like right here, right? Well, we're I mean. The same. Yeah. yeah and wa Washington know. does have separate laws, but we're the same community by and large. Yes. I know that we'll argue about this, but when I was a kid in the 80s and the 90s coming over to to, uh, to Idaho, I mean, we were all the same kids. You're not a thousand miles away. No. Okay. No. And, and just, we, just weren't, sure. we weren't on in Malibu. We weren't on the beach. I know they, they call him Malibu Bob. I think that's one of the... the um, the uh, monikers that he's been given, but okay. here's the reality. When Not I, a bad nickname. No, no. Hollywood, you know, all, all those those good nicknames. I've been called Hollywood before. I bet you I have. have. I have. Um, so the reason why that I got into the race is a couple of years ago, there was a town hall where the state legislators had gotten together to give us a, a monthly snapshot of what's going on in Boise. Right. And during this, uh, this one event that was held up in Rathdrum, uh, right before the legislators started to speak, Bob Norris got up and commandeered the mic from the MC and he began a, I don't know, a couple minute rant and complaint session and finger pointing and berating state legislators over what he said was not enough funding for sheriffs to do their work. And I was so appalled by his behavior I looked at my wife and I said, this is the sheriff that's supposed to stand between us and tyranny. I mean, there's no command presence. There's no leadership. There's no certainty. There's complaining. I was so appalled by that that I just told my wife, if somebody does not step in and challenge him, I will do it myself. And two years later, here we are. And as I've continually watched his performances over the next two years, uh, constant crying when he's when he's holding press conferences. I mean, I, I don't understand, 
you know, that kind of behavior. This is, again, we're talking about the sheriff that is the chief law enforcement entity of the county. And it's your job to be that straight as a rod, uh, you know, leader that everybody looks up to for stability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, statements about, well, there is no indicators that sex trafficking is here. Uh, denial about there really being any threat to us about border invaders here in Kootenai County. The list goes on. I think one of the famous ones that I saw uh, uh, that I witnessed was he was talking at a town hall stating, I can be bold and make bold moves because you are behind me. And I thought, as sheriff, you have to be bold regardless if anybody stands behind you because you know that what you're doing is righteous and the right thing to do. So right. if as a sheriff, you're relying on the things that you do or don't do based on the, the, the approval of the people, I think that's a, a person that has no business being anywhere near the chief law enforcement entity of the county. Right, being bold and being a leader has nothing to do with how many people are following you. No. I mean, God, in, in scripture, God calls many people to be bold, courageous, yeah. and a leader. Yeah despite how many people are following you. I know, you know, you think about Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. there's many people that denied him and even turned away from him. Yes. And he was completely 100% perfect. Yes. So let me ask you this, would that be, would you consider that answering the call? I believe it is answering the call. Um, duty is mine, results are God's. But at the end of the day, um, I'm here to do whatever I'm called to do and I hope that I'm doing a righteous thing. All right, so I wanna, I wanna get to uh, one more question, kind of maybe two. People want to know, are you saved, born again? Why do you not attend church? Well, I can tell you that I have been a follower of Jesus Christ since I was four years old. I have never not believed in Jesus. Uh, I attended churches for many, many years. Uh, I currently do not attend anywhere, and that's a personal reason that uh, I don't want to really divulge. But uh, every day I start out reading the word of God and praying for wisdom and trying to make certain that I am living a righteous life. And just because I don't go to a church does not mean that I have godly men and women that are speaking into my life and praying with me and, you know, lifting me up. So is it something you're open to? Are you seeking, looking to, maybe hoping to go sure, back wherever to the church? The, wherever the spirit leads. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. One more question. Uh, you have been accused of making criminal allegations against Sheriff Bob Norris and Commissioner Bruce Matari. Do you know the serious criminal allegations that they are claiming that you are spreading? There's zero, zero truth to what I'm being accused of. I have never made one accusation that either our sheriff nor his handler, Bruce Matari, has ever done something criminal. Now, what I have done is I have raised many questions about things that are unethical and immoral. And I have always left links uh, in any posts that I've made where people, if they truly want to look at the facts and, and see the resources that I'm seeing, are able to click through, read for themselves, and come up with their own uh, conclusion. But at the end of the day, uh, everything that is being said right now is nothing more than kabuki theater. They're trying for, to have us take our eyes off the ball. Uh, we need to be paying attention over here, and they're trying to get us to look over that way. So, you know, they can continue running their mouths about the, the bad things that I'm supposedly doing, but I say, prove it. Show me the clip where I ever accuse Bruce Matari or Bob Norris of committing any criminal activity. You won't find it, and I'll be waiting for you, Bob. All right, well, okay. With that said, let people know where they can find you at and how they can help and contribute or whatever. I'm on the <laughs> IdahoSheriff.com. <laughs> Is that too blunt? No, no not at all. I like blunt. Okay. I, just straightforward, just get it. So the IdahoSheriff.com, the IdahoSheriff.com is my website. You can find about my background, what my priorities are. You can join my campaign posse. We have uh, all, all sorts of media links, contributions, um, and I'm on every social media platform, I believe, except for TikTok, the Idaho Sheriff. So come check us out, follow us, like our stuff, um, and I'm learning all this terminology, and share it. So if you like our message, share the message and let people decide for themselves what's true and what is not. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed the time. Thank you, brother. All right.
You guys have a good day. Hopefully you enjoyed the interview. Stay strong and courageous.